Good morning, everyone. My name is Sally Hollingstead. I'm with Moss Adams, a national tax assurance and consulting firm. If you ever need help with any of those things, find me and I'll, I'll definitely get you hooked up with our services. I'm fortunate to be able to introduce our next presenting company, Ranger Energy Services. Ranger is one of the largest providers of high specification mobile rig well services, cased hole wireline services, and ancillary services in the US oil and gas industry. Their advanced solutions are helping operators meet the technical and operational challenges of today's extended reach horizontal wells. Ranger services facilitate operations throughout the life cycle of a well, including the completion, production, maintenance, intervention, workover, and abandonment phases. They're built for today's oil field with experienced crews and the latest technologies. Please give a warm welcome to Stuart Bowden, CEO of Ranger Energy Services. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Sally, for the introduction. Uh, Stuart Bowden, CEO of Ranger. Uh, I'm joined by Melissa Kugel, our CFO. We're, we're going to both do this presentation. I'll tell you, I normally have a bad habit of walking around the stage during the presentation and pointing at the slides, but I can't do that with the setup, so, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be okay. Um, so obviously, the, the, the common disclosures around forward-looking statements. Um, before I dive in, I think what I would love for you to take away from today's presentation when you think about Ranger is a few different things. So one is, what do we believe in at Ranger? What do we believe in as a management team? So the first thing is building leading market share in leading basins. I don't want to be the number three or four player in a basin. I want to be the number one or two player in a basin. The second thing is we have a heavy production or heavy focus on production related services, which we think enables us to be much more resilient through the cycle. And I'd point out for most operators, workover barrels are their cheapest incremental barrels. And the third thing is a focus on safety, high specification equipment, and operational excellence. So we think that that allows us and is building a company with rapid revenue growth, attractive gross and EBITDA margins, and very uh, strong conversion from EBITDA to free cash flow. So I'm proud to announce that at the end of Q2, we are debt free. We initiated a five cent per share dividend quarterly. We returned more than 30% of our free cash flow to shareholders in the form of uh, open market stock repurchases. And we closed at the beginning of Q3, which we announced a highly accretive tuck-in acquisition um, where we took over the pump down services of a competitor that was wanting to exit that business. So if you look at us today, we have about 2,000 employees. 5,000 operational assets, we're in 25 locations. After some of our acquisitions, we were up to 50, again, building kind of in-basin scale in fewer locations. Um, we do operate in markets that have historically been fragmented, and you'll hear us talk about being big believers in consolidation. Uh, we are the largest operator of high specification rigs, uh, workover and well servicing rigs in the United States. Um, that's about half of our revenue. About a third is related to wireline services, both production related, pump down services, and plug and perf. Uh, we have a large uh, production related business, particularly in the Bakken. Um, and then the balance is what we call processing solutions and ancillary services. That's our P&A business, rental and fishing tools. And we have a little quill tubing business that we picked up uh, in one of our acquisitions uh, that's in the, in the uh, DJ Basin, or in the Rockies. Year over year, 6% uh, quarter over quarter revenue growth, 22% increase quarter or year over year uh, quarterly uh, adjusted EBITDA growth. We are debt free. Um, we have a lot of liquidity um, and our free cash flow per share at the end of Q2 is 64 cents a share. So very proud of, uh, of what uh, we've accomplished, what the team has accomplished. Uh, here on the left-hand chart is just to show the horizontal rig count over time. And I would just remind everyone that as long as we as an industry are drilling more wells than we P&A, our, uh, our total addressable market continues to grow. So after a well is drilled, usually in the first six to nine months, you need to go back into that well and uh, put it on artificial lift. You need well servicing rigs more often than not to do that. And then you need to go back into those wells every year or two for remedial work, clean out, intervention. Refrax is a trend that's starting to increase. And that actually helps us a lot because we need to go in, pull out the equipment that's in the well, the completion equipment, the refrack happens, and then we go back into the well. And on the right, you can see just the rapid decline in wells that are drilled in the US. Um, and again, a lot of our services help 
help support the slowing of those, of those declines. I talked a lot about that we have a heavy production focus. So across the top of this chart is the value chain. And you can see the numbers, if you can't see it, uh, it shows the amount of our revenue that's tied to different parts of the value chain. So we do not have any drilling uh, exposure. About 30 to 40% is related to completion work. Uh, 50, 50 to 60 uh, is production. And then decommissioning is a little less than 10%. So more than half of our, much more than half, or the majority of our, of our uh, revenue exposure uh, and margin exposure is to uh, the part of the value chain after completions. Um, and again, below that, you can just see some of the service lines um, and some of the services that, that we offer. To talk a little bit about the high specification rig market, I mentioned consolidation. Um, we did, we bought a, the kind of non-California, non-water assets from BASIC at the end of 2021. Uh, and as a result of that transaction, we are the largest operator of well servicing rigs uh, in the United States. I would almost be so bold as to say that that market segment changed overnight uh, at, the, at the end of that transaction. You now, st you now sit today where the top five or six players have a little bit more than half of the market share in the U.S. And so this is a market that's now starting to behave much more rationally like you think about land drilling or even the fracks, you know, two segments that have consolidated rapidly over the last couple of years. I think I've talked a little bit about this, but again, we talked about the, the, the free cash flow generation of the business, our strong balance sheet. We, 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 we kind of call it a fortress balance sheet, something that we think is very important to us. It gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, we have been very aggressive uh, in announcing and implementing our capital returns framework, so we're, we're very shareholder friendly. Um, and we do think that we still have opportunity to grow through acquisition. But I would highlight, we're gonna take what the market gives us. We're gonna be very selective uh, and we're gonna be very disciplined. We know that we can't do deals that aren't accretive for our shareholders. Again, I'm kind of hammering the uh, points home, but uh, it has been a strong year for us despite some of the market headwinds that I think the industry has uh, shown. We did see quarter over quarter growth. Um, we have you know, indicated that we, we expect to see significant growth in Q3. We achieved our net debt zero target that we've been very publicly um, going after over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, this year, um, we've paid down almost $20 million of debt. So again, we're debt free. We generated about $28 million of free cash flow. Um, and in the first half of the year, that was almost 70%. So we, as a target, we talk about being more than 60% conversion of EBITDA to free cash flow. Uh, we announced $35 million of potential share repurchases. Uh, we have to date uh, repurchased about six million dollars shares uh, so we've and then in Q2 that was almost six million dollars was approaching six million dollars um, in in Q2 uh, and again as I said we announced a dividend um, we do have a new debt facility um, we are that was really to streamline our capital structure uh, so over our transactions uh, and with this new facility, we have a very simple capital structure, a common stock and, a, and an ABL, and that's really all there is other than capital leases. Talked a little bit about how we want to use the, the free cash flow that we generate. Again, I think one of the things that we're very excited about the business is it is a business uh, that, can, that can generate a lot of free cash flow. So on the kind of middle circle you, you see here, so our estimate is that we'll generate 55 to $65 million of free cash flow in, uh, in 2023. Uh, as I said, we'll use a little bit of that for dividends, which we announced at the end of Q2. Uh, we have been doing uh, share repurchases. Uh, we were very aggressive, which was announced in Q2 in particular. Um, we are gonna save some powder and some flexibility for growth opportunities. As I said, we did announce, uh, when we announced our Q2 earnings, uh, a small $7 million tuck-in acquisition, um, but it was a company that uh, we felt like we could move very quickly on, and we could integrate it with, uh, with, with min minimal, virtually no, no integration expense, and we think that that uh, has a payback of uh, well under two years. Um, and then obviously we use some of the free cash flow that we generate in the first part of the year for a debt pay down. Going forward, I think that's how we'll always kind of think about it. You know, we're gonna be opportunistic. Uh, we have committed to at least 25% of our free cash flow being returned to shareholders, either through dividends or share repurchases. Um, and depending on how, uh, you know, if we're trading at discounted levels, we would expect that to be higher. 
uh, or we, we may save uh, more for acquisitions, uh, just kind of depending on what the market, market will give us. And down at the bottom, kind of in the middle, you can see sort of the march down of our uh, debt uh, really going down to, to zero. Um, and then you can see our free cash flow quarter over uh, quarter on the, bottom, on the, on the right-hand side. We're pretty repetitive. <laughs> um, so uh, again, uh, attractive capital returns framework. We're trying to be, we're trying to be very, very uh, shareholder friendly. Um, and again, I think we kind of recognize um, that ultimately it is a kind of a new world uh, in oil services. And I think we're trying to prove that. I think we are, you know, for the services that we're in, we, we would say that we're a bit of a unicorn uh, and that we are generating sustainable cash flow. We're debt free uh, and we are aggressively returning capital back to our shareholders. If you kind of think about uh, going forward, what are some of the acquisitions that, that we think about, that we like? Uh, we're big believers in consolidation. It's benefited us. Uh, we think it helps the industry. We think it provides operational efficiency and better service to our customers. Um, we do think that there is more to do uh, in our existing service lines, uh, in wireline, uh, in high-spec rigs, but we have to be selective. Right? So not all companies have the same philosophy that we do around sort of safety and maintaining equipment. Um, and we know that we have to do deals that, that are accretive. Um, we do have some service lines. I would highlight P&A, uh, fishing and rental that we think have a lot of growth room. Um, and then there are some new service lines uh, that are kind of adjacent. But again, it's sticking with this production related theme that we think we could tuck in as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa who will walk through some of the uh, recent financial performance. Hi, everyone. Um, so Stuart walked you through a lot of um, sort of just the entire investment thesis of Ranger. Um, I'll show you sort of what that translates into when we talk about just our financial results in general. Some of these statistics you've seen before, but, but it really does demonstrate when you look at our year-over-year -year performance. Stuart's referenced we actually um, we bought all the basic assets in the fall of 2021. We were busy deploying those assets in the first half of last year. We really found our stride. So for those of you that have actually been looking at our performance, our H2 performance back half of last year, we were at approximately $50 million of EBITDA, and that really set a new benchmark for us, and we've been looking to repeat and grow off of that base. I think what's really worth mentioning is all of the gas market pressure this year. So there's been a lot of pressure on a lot of our peers, um, some bigger uh, and same size. Ranger's actually been able to hold steady and grow year over year in a market that's largely been on decline given rate counts. We think that speaks directly to the production exposure we talked about earlier and our essentially installed base ever expanding. Now we have the completion upside exposure, right? So, so as rigs come back online, what I would encourage and point to is if you think about our year-to-date performance and you think about rigs going back online, we've been able to actually preserve a lot of our base and grow because we've held results steady. So we've lost some rig count. You've heard us talk about that in prior quarters. We've been able to replace that. So as new rigs come online, you could expect that growth to kind of start to catalyze again for us. And it gives us a lot of sort of optimism and you know, hope for the future, if you will. Um, on an adjusted EBITDA basis, we're at 52% growth year over year and margins expanding over 300 BIPs to 13%. We had looked at and touched last year 15%. That was a high water mark we're looking to get back to this year and continue to grow back off of. If we look at the bridge, I mean, the only thing that this sort of just looks a couple of things to point out here, we're actually growing across all of our segments. So people think of us as a rig business, but if you actually look at all of our segments on a year over year basis, we've actually grown in all three of them. We've actually translated that into EBITDA growth of, across all three of them. And, and you heard us mention last week in our earnings release call, we actually were kind of caught off guard this year. We had a very unusual phenomenon in our medical cost, um, just high cost payments, some, some really sick individuals, unfortunately. Um, that affected us by over $3 million on a, a year over year basis. So again, you think about what that impact would have been had those dollars been in our P&L in the first half of the year. And we were touching those sort of mid 15% uh, EBITDA margins. So it gets us really excited. All of the businesses are growing. They're all growing year over year. And as rig count starts to increase again, we should be able to have more than our fair share of that portion of increase. Um, when we look at our guidance, you know, we've talked a little bit, Stuart mentioned the, the free cash flow guidance, but what I would point to is actually sort of on the bottom right corner here, 
Again, you're talking about a market this year that largely has been somewhat downish, right? And we're still looking at year over year growth of, of touching you know, double digits at 10% in our midpoint. We've actually been able to hold guidance at the low end. So we reset the ranges really to kind of, you know, but we are still sort of on track, particularly on profitability, to meet the low end of our guidance range that we had originally published at the beginning of this year. That's partially because we had a lot of plans to grow. We were actually prepping rigs to work. We've been able to put new rigs to work this year. They've replaced some rigs that we've lost in gas basins. Um, but a free cash flow conversion percentage of 60%. We like to put, tell people we're asset light. We recognize we have assets. I think we're sort of a best of the both worlds company because we have a strong asset base. We have rigs, we have some barriers to injury given those assets and that iron we carry. That said, because of where we sit in the production side, we're not fracking, we're not pushing um, you know, high pressure, we're not pushing sand through our equipment. So our equipment tends to wear down at a much slower pace. So once you make the initial asset investment, you actually get to harvest that for a much more extended period of time and we don't have to replace CapEx nearly as frequently as many of our fracking peers or drilling peers or things like that. You know, and I would tell you kind of as we wrap up and think about things, you know, in holistically touching on the points we've sort of already raised, when you think about Ranger, I think what we want you to take away is there is, there is growth capacity here combined with returns commitments. So, so if we're returning 25%, that means the other 75% we can continue to grow with. And that growth might be through rare share repurchases, frankly, and giving you more through that. But, but that that other 75% can be applied towards accretive returns. And we actually have idle asset capacity. So we have probably the largest asset you know, fleet that's not working in the US right now. And so as more demand comes into the play, um, we'll be able to redeploy those assets. So we can put more trucks, we can put more rigs to work. So our organic growth trajectory is at a much lower price point than many of our peers. Um, and then when we talk about the dynamic business model, again, sort of demonstrated it through the actual financial performance this year, this production exposure we sort of constantly bang the drum on, it truly is unique because our TAM is always growing because we're not exclusively exposed to drilling and completion. We have some upside there. So as more rigs come online, more wells need to be completed. Ranger sits in that piece of the cycle. But because we have this production exposure sitting in our customer's maintenance cycle of the wells, we will always have an asset base and a work base to work off of. So with that, um, I think those were sort of our prepared remarks for the day. We're going to be able to take a few questions in Lawrence B. If anyone wants to follow us over there and ask any follow-up questions. Really appreciate your time today, everyone.